That's everybody <laughs> on this nice, icky day of exciting voting um, events. Um, I hope everybody has a sticker. I see a sticker there. I've left mine on. Um, and um, we may get into politics. We don't know yet. <laughs> Let's find out. <laughs> um, this is the second of uh, uh, the fall uh, Digital Humanities and Media Studies roundtables. And the way we conceptualize those is to get into some sticky stuff with interdisciplinary questions, with um, public scholarship in this regard, of the, uh, digital scholarship, multimodal scholarship. Um, last year we interfaced digital humanities and media studies as a sort of beginning um, round table. Um, today we want to uh, really engage with um, the practical and the copyright and the, the part of the teaching questions also with regard to um, OER. So there's a lot of territory we're trying to engage with, um, but I think all presenters may agree that they're interconnected, and your questions are more than invited, and your objections, your suggestions, your creativity is all part of this discussion. And each presenter will uh, talk for about five to seven minutes about their expertise and their experiences, and then we'll open it up uh, for general discussions, uh, moderated by uh, my colleague Brenda Brigaman, um, very well known to you, um, the editor chair of writing, and I will introduce our speakers. Thank you so much for coming. Help yourself to cookies and coffee as we move along. Uh, first, uh, our first presenter will be Catherine Fitzpatrick. Um, some of you may know her from uh, H. Commons at the MLA, uh, famous. She is the Director of Digital Humanities and Professor of English at Michigan State University, and prior to assuming this role in 2017, she served as Associate Executive Director and Director of Scholarly Communication of the Modern Language Association, where she was Managing Editor of PMLA and other MLA publications. During that time, she also held an appointment as Visiting Research Professor of English at NYU. <coughs> She's author of Generous Thinking, The University and the Public Good, which is coming out this fall. Um, January. January, okay, this fall. <laughs> Just teasing. Um, and I hope very much that we'll hear about that. And uh, her other very well-known book is called Planned Obsolescence, Publishing, Technology, and the Future of the Academy, which came out in 2011, and The Anxiety of Obsolescence, The American Novel in the Age of Television. She is project director of United's Commons, an open access, open source network serving more than 14,700 scholars and practitioners in the humanities, which is like a bit of applause. <laughs> it's really amazing. Um, our next speaker, equally well known, I hope, um, is Cheryl Ebal, and she's the director of digital publishing collaborative at Wayne State University Library since 2006. Paul has been editor of the online peer-reviewed open access journal Kairos, Rhetoric, Technology, and Pedagogy, which exclusively publishes digital media scholarship. Her recent research and editorial workflows and digital publishing infrastructures can be found in multiple journals and edited collections, as well as on her personal repository. I will not read the URL here. <laughs> I'll send that out. She is the project director for Vega, and I hope you hear more about Vega in our discussion, an open access multimedia academic publishing platform and serves as the executive director of the Council of Editors of Learned Journals. Very powerful combination of resources here. Kathy Labrador from Yukon Stavish Library um, has been the open educational resources librarian for Yukon since the open and affordable initiative began in 2015, so it's fairly recent. Faculty at all Yukon campuses and in many disciplines are currently using open textbooks or have created and or modified educational resources for their courses. A full description of the initiative can be found at open.yukon.edu, that's easy. Um, prior to her library career, Labdorf was an itinerant professional musician, or she advised me, I can also turn that into a professional itinerant musician, <laughs> and instructor for 25 years. Welcome. I don't 
don't know if I have to, um, or if you want me to introduce um, Brenda Brigman. Um, and as I read through my paperwork here, Brenda joined us recently as the Edna Chair of Writing and the Director of First Year Writing um, at UConn. Her specialties and interest areas um, are deaf studies, disability studies, disability art and creative expression, multimodality and access to education, global disability issues, teaching college writing, writing program, and women in higher education. And she's currently doing research on posting Mabel, an epistolary biography of Mabel Hubbard Bell, Alexander Graham Bell's deaf wife. Um, some of you may know Aktion T4, Economics, Euthanasia, Eugenics, um, which is um, on the project page of the DHMS website. And Disability and Rhetoric, an edited collection of key publications that intersect those two fields with John Duffy and um, Drew Holiday. Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome also to our speakers. And uh, I hope that we'll have a very productive discussion. And I will be quiet now and let Kathy go right ahead. <laughs> try to do this without creating technological havoc. We can make that work. Okay, yay, that worked. Um, hi, thank you, Anka, for inviting us. I'm really glad to get the opportunity to be here and talk a bit and yeah, announce, yes, there we go, okay. Um, so my approach to thinking about these questions that we've been asked to consider today around open publishing, multimodal publishing, um, and, and other forms of public scholarship really come through a, a series of personal experiences that began out of sheer frustration, quite frankly. Um, in 2002, um, I had just finished the process as an assistant professor of revising my first, my dissertation into the thing that would become my first book. And I had been by the end of that process working on that project for what felt like 10 years. I mean, it, it, it had been forever to get through the entire process. And at the end of it, what I had was a very large Word file on my hard drive. And I had several backups. And I had no conviction whatsoever that anyone other than me was ever going to read this thing. And I, would, I felt just stifled. I had a couple of articles that had been published, but I had no sense that anybody had read them. And I, I really just wanted to get some stuff in front of people and get them to read it and think about you know, the, what it was that I was interested in. Um, so I, I, you know, one day in a fit of procrastination, as one does, um, I was on the internet and discovered that a friend that I went to grad school with had started a blog. And I had only in the previous year heard of these blog things um, and didn't know anyone who had one because who did that sort of thing, right? But then there was this friend of mine who had this blog and it was funny and it was erudite and it was you know, up to the minute in terms of things that he was writing about that were coming across his desk and that were in the news and so forth. And I knew that people were reading it because they were leaving comments on it and they were talking to him about it and they were encouraging him to expand ideas and to think more about the stuff that he was writing about. And I thought, this is the most brilliant thing I've ever seen. And so in a fit of um, both frustration and um, in an exercise in immediate gratification, quite frankly, I started a blog in 2002. It's called Planned Obsolescence. And um, I, I posted for the first almost a year with just a few people that were reading it that I had reached out to and told that I was posting with or posting on this blog. And they came and they commented. And then I, I got in contact with some more people. And I, I discovered um, this cluster of scholars in literary fields who were also starting to blog. Um, this was a cluster of bloggers who were working together called the Word Herders. Um, and it was a grad student out of University of Maryland who had like, gotten some hosting space and was hosting blogs for friends of his. And um, the grad student was Jason Rohde. 
um, who went on um, from his grad student life to work first for the National Endowment for the Humanities um, in the Office of Digital Humanities and now is at um, Social Science Research Council. Um, and a whole cluster of other people that I got in contact with through these networked ways that we were all posting and writing with one another and commenting on one another's stuff. And I, the thing that I didn't expect, you know, when I started this blog, I thought, like, I have things to say and I want people to read them. I want to publish stuff. I want an audience. And what I ended up with was a community. And that was really surprising to me. I wasn't expecting that turn. In, in the course of the work that we did, one of the things that if you dig into my old blog history you will find is the, the very long struggle that I had to get that first book published. Um, it was a real uh, issue. And I posted about the struggle and about the problems with scholarly publishing as it, it was being practiced and in many ways continues to be practiced um, today. And in the process, started thinking out loud about what it would be to start an all-electronic space in which, like blogging, one could simply publish work and get immediate feedback and think, of, think in collective ways about what scholarship should be going forward. And with some colleagues, um, the, the folks from the Institute for the Future of the Book and my colleague Abby Santo, um, who's now at Old Dominion University, we ended up founding Media Commons. Um, this network launched in 2006. We just recent, recently went through a very long redesign process and it is now relaunched re um, in a much more modern uh, interface, which is great. Um, and it, one of the things that we discovered, again, like I have to learn things three times, apparently, before they stick. Um, one of the things that we discovered in this, we set out to create a digital press for media studies, to enable scholars in media studies to publish in digital and interactive ways. And what we ended up building was a community. Again, it was a space in which folks could come together and could talk about work in a much more ongoing and up-to-the-minute fashion. Um, having done all of this work and having spent a lot of time mouthing off on the internet um, about digital publishing and the ways that it should be done, I at some point realized that I had another book in me. Um, and that book turned out to be Planned Obsolescence. I did name it after the blog, just because. Um, mostly an inside joke that no one but me is abused by. Um, but um, one of the things that happened in the course of publishing Planned Obsolescence um, was that I told the press, um, having done all this work online, having built this community, having drafted and worked on all this material with these people, I want them to be my reviewers for the manuscript. I want them to help me figure out what needs to happen in the revision process. So I want to post the whole draft online and get people online to respond to it. And the press's immediate response, my editor's response was, oh my god, why would you want to do that? Um, but we did. Um, so in 2009, opened up planned obsolescence for an open review process online. It went extremely well. It um, got a lot of attention. Um, it did not, as the press was afraid, cannibalize sales of the print object. It actually promoted sales of the print object because people found out that the book was out there and came to it and so forth. Um, and it was a really productive process. So I have another book, um, as you've heard, Generous Thinking, which is going to be coming out in January. And we did another process, um, just slightly different from the one that we did with Planned Obsolescence. And in part, that process is different. Um, with, with Planned Obsolescence, you know, I got a couple of friends to kind of go through and leave a comment or two just to let people know that I actually really did want comments. And then I totally threw it open to the internet and I announced it all over the place and people came and commented and I didn't know the majority of commenters. Um, they were people who I met through that process. This time out, um, well, it's 2018 and the internet is a little different now. Um, it's a darker place and it can be a little scarier. And um, I got nervous about how I wanted to construct the community that I was going to release this text out into. 
So I, I used Humanities Commons, um, which is the network that I worked on at the NLA and that I continue to direct and that I would be happy to talk more about when we get to the discussion part of things. Um, but we ended up posting generous thinking on Humanities Commons first behind a password wall. And I invited about 40 readers to come in and spend two weeks with the manuscript and leave whatever comments they wanted to leave. And then I opened it to the world. And it, it staged an opening of community in a way that kept things relatively positive. Now, I'm not going to say that the open review process that we did for Generous Thinking was all you know, rainbows and unicorns. Um, there, there are some really stingy com comments in there, too. Some things that were a little hard to hear or to read, I guess. Um, and there are some things that I wish maybe I, I, like, things I wish I had thought of before I put the manuscript out there. But by and large, it was an extraordinarily positive process. And I think the book is going to wind up being much better for having been through this kind of community review than it would have been. Um, so it turns out, again, like I said, I have to learn things three times before I actually realize that that's what I'm working on. Um, that while I have thought all along that what I was doing as a scholar was producing scholarship, on some level what I've been doing all along has been producing communities and really attempting to think about what the relationship between community and conversation and scholarship is. Um, so I'm going to leave that there for now, and I'm going to hand this off to Cheryl, and um, we will go from there. Good. intersected on a number of occasions throughout the mouse. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, there you go. I'm still used to a back. <laughs> <laughs> um, they've intersected, and, and part part of the reason why they've, they've intersected is because uh, we have uh, very similar approaches in the way that we do some things, such as having to learn things multiple times before we actually invest them, and realizing that, oh yes, we're building communities and disciplines without even realizing necessarily that we're doing that. Um, and also I have to do everything the hard way, right? That's just part of part of my nature. Um, I've, I've always not done the thing that I was supposed to do. And I did that as a child, and I did that as a tenure track faculty member. Um, <laughs> and that's presented some challenges in my life, um, but those were challenges that I wanted to take on and that I actually then pushed harder to do, uh, so to work against the grain, if you will. Um, and that goes back to, to my very first, uh, in my master's program, mm -hmm. I ended up creating the first interactive digital media uh, thesis, an ETD, um, at, at the school that I was at, Virginia Commonwealth, um, for my MFA, uh, my MFA poetry thesis. And that, you know, fortuitously looking back, I realized that now I'm working in a library full time, and I, the first person that I had to talk to in that project was the preservation librarian, who I didn't even know what, that was a position back then, you know, the young, young old age of uh, 26. <laughs> um, but uh, so I forged ahead on that despite a bunch of obstacles, and it was that turned out to be a successful project. And you know, I wrote a dissertation about a topic that my all of my uh, dissertation advisors were like, Cheryl, you will not get a tenure track job in rhetoric and composition if you write your dissertation on flash poetry. And I was like, watch me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that wasn't totally true because during my PhD program, I became an editor of Kairos, uh, the journal that I've put up here. Um, and my first, my very first academic publication is actually in this journal uh, from during my MFA program. And I realized that I could um, marry um, the relationship between teaching academic writing and teaching word and image. And while to many of you in this room, if I look around and the guests, at least half of you are graduate students and maybe in this class, then 
you probably are familiar with something called multimodal composition. Well, like that term didn't exist when I was getting my PhD, okay? Like it was sort of at the very beginning of that. In the early 2000s, we were just reading the New London Group. I'm not gonna delve into ret comp theory right now, so. Um, but we, we didn't know anything about visual rhetoric really at the time. We were still trying to figure all that stuff out. So I was like, oh, here's the computer and here's visual stuff. Like, boom, how can we put these two together? Well, Kairos was already doing that. Right? Kairos started, for those of you in the room who don't, aren't familiar with this journal, the, the five brief bullet points are, it is the longest, most continuously running peer-reviewed journal that publishes scholarly multimedia. Right? It's been publishing since 1996, started by a bunch of graduate students. Right? It has become the leading digital journal in the field of writing studies, if I may say so. Um, so we worked really long and hard to do that, and I became an, a section editor as a graduate student, as a PhD student, um, as a way to figure out, okay, how do I write? I didn't, I didn't know how to write. I wasn't trained to write academically in my MFA program. In PhD programs, they don't often teach you how to write. So <laughs> how do you learn how to write? Academically, you become an editor. Uh, and you become an editor of a web textual journal, which is not going to teach you how to write articles. It's going to teach you how to write web texts. So let me show you what a web text looks like. This is our most recent issue. Um, here we've got a piece, right? This is, it's all open. I, I gave you the first bullet point, but I didn't give you the other four bullet points. Kairos is peer-reviewed, right? Has always been collaboratively peer-reviewed. So we have at least five editorial board members who work together uh, to review a text as it comes in. Uh, so it's, it's where, where Kathleen's project is the door for open peer review is flung wide open to the public, right, at a certain point in her book process. Kairos' door is sort of half open, right? We allow the editorial board members to converse, and they know who the author is, and the authors know who, who they are. Um, so it's peer reviewed, it's fully open, anybody can get to it, right? We've been doing this for 24 years, um, started by graduate students, and we only publish these weird web text things. So in the most recent issue, here's one of our web texts, right? Sean's at MX piece on designing captions. So he's talking about the visual rhetorical purpose of how captions work. And you can scroll down, but then all of a sudden you get this navigation menu that doesn't use just words, right? It's using images to get at different things. This mouse is being really particular. Oops, back. Right, so I'm just gonna randomly click on one because the thing about hypertext is you can read it in any order. And that's part of the point, that, that as a reader, you have to uh, bring you know, your understanding of the piece. You have to use the salt theory, basically, in your reading process to understand how the web text makes meaning. So in this piece, it has a bunch of different sections. And here's a good example of, of the author trying to It's a wireless mouse and it's literally doing its own thing. <laughs> and my, maybe that thing is also. I was wondering if there was some interference. I'm not touching it and then it goes back up. Okay, I don't know what's going on. Um, okay, but you saw that image up above. <laughs> and I can use the arrows. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to back away. All right. <laughs> This image is just a microcosm of what uh, Sean is trying to do in this piece, where he's taking the original um, picture from, I don't remember what, the Goonies. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're like, oh, I know that. Uh, so he's taking this, um, this image from the Goonies, and the original captions would just say, all, all groaning and struggling. Right? But he's trying to show visually an experiment of ways where you might be able to to see that differently, right? So this guy is burning and struggling with a red circle, right? So Sean's added the red circle, and he's added the black diamond and the star and the, and the square. So like visually and connotatively, what do all of those different images mean in, in addition to what the linguistic, right, the discursive captions are telling you? So yeah, sure, you can publish that in a print journal. I'm not saying you can't, although getting color in a print journal is difficult. <laughs> But if you scroll through, right, hear some groans about that, um, burning and struggling. But as you, as you go through this piece, which I'm just not going to do with the mouse, you get video 
portions, right? Mm -hmm. And other pieces that Kairos has pub have published have been these interactive pieces where you literally have to drag parts of the screen to other parts of the screen to make it do something. Um, and all of that is the author's work working on this stuff so that form and content come together through the author's design to make the rhetorical argument, right? So that's what web texts do, and that's what we've been publishing and peer reviewing and successfully getting people tenure with for decades now. Okay? So when I'm thinking about public scholarship and digital scholarship, Kairos is my mainstay, right? I research how we publish these things, how authors come to these things, I try to run camps so that other people can learn how to build these things for this and other venues, right? Um, and so uh, Anka mentioned Vega earlier. I got to the point where we couldn't keep perpetuating how Kairos is built because it is a hipster handcrafted journal if ever there were one, right? <laughs> it's, it takes 30 staff members spread across the US manually editing HTML code so that it's up to W3C standards to get this thing all working together, which is completely unsustainable in the long run for anybody else to take up this, this kind of project. And people have taken this up web textual publishing and other venues, um, but most of those journals don't stick around for very long, if at all. Um, so we built Vega so that we could sort of have a turnkey content management system for other people to build these kinds of things and publish them on the fly. So just like Kathleen's experiment of like uh, experience of saying, well, let's build a press for media studies. <laughs> Vega's kind of the same thing, except it's like, let's build a system, a platform, that any discipline can use to publish digital scholarship that promotes it being open and that promotes it having multimedia components. Because we don't just do research in words, right? That's, it's a ludicrous idea to think that we do or ever have truly. We just have to force it into words a lot of times. So having that public nature is, is incredibly important, the open nature of the, of the public scholarship. Um, and then as I'm turning this over to Kathy, I want to just say one more project that we've been working on. Again, I'm not going to bring it up, but I will close this window out for you. Um, my last, the last publication, my most recent publication that I made was this piece called, um, it was an edited collection called um, Bad Ideas About Writing. I don't know if y'all heard of that. Yeah. Um, I love that title. <laughs> that book started as a Facebook post. <laughs> right, that my colleague Drew Lowy at St. Edwards University in Austin, he was complaining about something happening in Beck Comic. I like to say we were complaining about Stanley Fish, because none of us like Stanley Fish. <laughs> <laughs> and how like, Stanley Fish has all these things to say about how to teach writing that he writes about in the New York Times, and we're just like, screw you. Like, we actually know what we're talking about. Apologies if you actually like Stanley Fish's writing on writing, because we don't. And so we're like, we need to come up with a book that's geared towards a public audience, like an actual non-academic audience, right, to be very clear on what we mean by public, um, that we can get published that is like these little short pieces about actual writing research. And we ended up with over 100 submissions. We got the call, the CFP out, within a week. Because I jumped on his Facebook page, I was like, Heck yeah, we're gonna do this project. And so we wrote the CFP, it was super, like, tongue in cheek. We sent it out there, we got 100 proposals. We accepted 63 of them and then published this book within a year that included 63 three to four page chapters, all about writing research, boiled down into, it couldn't include any original research, right? These were not meant to be articles. And I tell you something, especially to the grad students in the room, when you're working with people who are full professors and people who are master's students, and people who think they know how to teach writing don't always know the right genre the first time around. This is not something unusual, right? So it took like three or four revisions for everybody to get the genre, right? Because we were essentially asking them to write a five paragraph essay. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, right, that, right? But we did it, and now we've had like 15,000 downloads of that book. We just published it on the library website. Like we got some people to review it to say, yeah, this sounds good to us. And then we just stuck it online. 15,000 downloads. I was going to use that book to go up for full at my last job. Like that's a big deal. So. When you're thinking about publishing and reaching for the public, like push your boundaries because there are possibilities and there are precedents, and you can do it.
mics. Is that too loud or too quiet? It's okay. All right. So, um, wow, I am so blown out of the water by you two women. You are fabulous. Um, I am not, uh, I don't create that kind of material, but um, I'm a librarian, so I have a separate role. But back when I was the library and I was that professional itinerant musician, um, the, the web came out all of a sudden in the late 90s or early 90s. My husband was way, so I said, oh my God, I've got to get Netscape Navigator. I have to get online. So while he was gone, I, I got us connected to the internet. And that was like, you know, so the, all the stuff you were talking about, um, it was like opening such great doors back then. It was wonderful. Now you're right, it's dark. But it's, uh, see, Tim Berners uh, Lee said we need to make the web safe for him. That article was out yesterday. So anyway, then I, uh, I was a musician. And the web really brought me into becoming a librarian. I went to Syracuse University on their distance learning program, so I used the our good old Husky CT, Web CT, like all online, and um, um, and I've just been on the web ever since. And so you're all doing stuff that I would love to do and that I, I do sometimes, but not at the level that you're doing it. So I'm the Open Education Librarian now. I've been here since uh, 1998 in various, many, many roles. My other hat is Women's Studies Librarian as well. And uh, in 2015, so uh, Sally Reese, if any of you remember Sally Reese, she uh, was accosted by a bunch of students from UConn Perth as well as from the younger student government asking her if we, the UConn could look into open educational resources. Open educational resources on this campus is a grassroots effort. The students started it. The students were talking to faculty. The students were interviewing faculty. They were finding out, do you know what we are? You know, learning, uh, finding all kinds of things and experimenting, and then bringing it up the ladder. So they went to talk to Sally Reese, and Sally Reese said, gee, free textbooks? That's the last time you're going to hear me use that word, because there's nothing free about OER. Um, and, uh, and she said, well, we'll look into it. So she brought it to the Dean's Council, our live, you know, the, uh, it was a different council. But I had a vice pro, our vice provost at the library said, oh, yes. I know about OER, so that's how it came housed in the library, which is very uh, common these days. And uh, we took it from there. But remember that it's the students, and you'll see UConn first students out there rallying for open, as well as the many other great causes that they have. So I began, let me bring this, okay? So uh, you, you heard that the site is open.uconn.edu, and I decided that I would just put my my talk right on my open page so that you could go here and see and check on anything that you'd like to look at what's happening here. It's under the events uh, uh, area. And so our, yeah, I see what you mean about that. Our, our open in initiative, our open, we had, we won a grant, we got some money. So mostly what we, we've done, we've worked with lots of faculty here for redesigning their course. I, you see I have a German film. What this faculty did, his name was Shane Peterson, was he, he thought, this is a film course. The book is really not doing it. You know, so he redid his whole course, his whole syllabus, with websites as well as other readings that he found that he found to be more effective. The students loved it. And uh, so there was, there was no textbook involved here. When you get into the humanities, you know, there's multiple resources out there. He was great. He's now down in Georgia, so I don't know if anyone's doing that. Uh, sociology course, this was taught by a grad student, um, and uh, race, class, and gender. And he had been using an ineffective textbook as well. And so he said, well, I think I'll just do He didn't realize he could use library materials. Our initiative is open slash affordable, OK? Um, he said, well, I don't know if they would really understand um, sociology articles, uh, but I really want to try it. So he built his whole course, he threw out the textbook, built it around resources that he had found in various places, popular as well as uh, the research, any, anything that was fitting in with, with his, uh, his syllabus. And um, by the end of the semester, the students were so thankful for that course, for getting them into these sociological journals, these articles, and what one 
one student actually said she loved hear, reading a topic but written by different people to get these different voices rather than one textbook getting that one voice. So that was, uh, these are all incentives. So these people, um, you know, proposed them and they, they, we have money for grants. We've also had textbook adaptions, adaptations, excuse me, and, and revision, uh, plain old adoptions of open OER, as well as our own chemistry department. Um, Edward Neff created an OpenStax, a, a Yukon version of chemistry. This is chemistry. Open. He took the regular chemistry book and he flipped it on its head so that it could be taught from the atoms first direction. And uh, that has uh, gone national. It's OpenStax is very um, one of the top producers of textbooks. Now, they're mostly science and math. Science and math generally still needs to use textbooks for some. And these are almost uh, mostly for the lower level, 1,000, 2,000 level classes. But now we're at, uh, with a grant from our former provost, Moon Choi, he came up with $100,000 for people to create new textbooks at UConn for large enrollment classes. So we have, we do have one book written by a UConn professor, Ellen Carrillo, who's in Waterbury, and she was working on this with a commercial publisher but was unhappy with the direction they were trying to take her. She did not want to go in that direction. So uh, then she heard about OER and she came over and talked to me and she found the WAC Clearing House which is writing across the curriculum. They were happy to take it on at the point where it was, and they finished the development, and her book is Open Access. It is, uh, how many know what CC BY means? Just say yes, you know what CC BY. How about CC BY ND? Okay, so, okay. Now, that's, and that's the critical part that, uh, that I would like to address in the rest of my talk. Uh, CC BY as Kathleen with her digital humanities. CC BY is a very, very open uh, license which is on top of copyright. Um, open access materials, you're welcome to use them, download them, they're free, but uh, you don't, you cannot revise them. They are not revisable, okay? Unless you get permission from the author, just like you would with copyright. So this is uh, Ellen Carrillo, she's at the Waterbury campus. And then currently we have a physical chemistry book in process. Uh, we are working on that right now with Scribe, an academic publisher, and we will have a probability book. So these will be UConn created textbooks that will reside in our repository, our open repository, uh, and they will be fully uh, print, online, PDF, ebook, all the different versions, totally accessible. All, all the things you need to make a book accessible by all, it, which is it's a big process. And in the depository, repository will be the source codes because with CC BY materials, authors need to be able to download a usable source code so that they can rearrange it, revise it, do whatever they uh, need to do with it in the teaching world. Okay, I'll get more into that. Um, so below this, there are uh, some other sources uh, for, I'm not gonna open this one, but this helps you to understand the levels of openness that you can see from totally closed to totally open. OER is all the way across the top, but OA, open access, can be various places in the middle. Creative Commons, and I'm sure most everybody's heard of Creative Commons, yes? They are the amazing enablers um, where they have created these licenses which can be laid on top of copyright. When you write, when you create something that is OER, you own the copyright to it. You don't give it away, you don't give it to the publisher, nobody tries to take it away from you, it is yours. But then you can give your users permission, okay? permission to do certain things. And you need to make that really clear um, and if you, if you, there's some things you have to keep in mind when you're doing that, and I'll get to that later. So I'll leave these for you to look at. I found this to be very uh, informative of all kinds of crazy questions. Um, but the critical difference with, yeah, 
the, the, there's one critical difference uh, from OER to OA. Um, but thinking in general, open access really is a type of publishing. That's what it is. It's not about, it's not the artifact itself. It, it is a type of publishing. And it's generally done for research publications. And it, what it does is enable, or it enables the widest readership as examples for both Cheryl and Kathleen, when it's online, people come and they, and they read it. It opens the doors, and with the sciences, especially open access science, open science will increase the speed of research and the speed of development. And uh, for instance, there's a disease called, uh, not Parkinson's disease, but the other, Huntington's disease. Harvard has that really closed down. Other people are trying to do research on Huntington's disease, but Park, Harvard does not let its research out. Very little has happened to people with Huntington's disease. There's not been a lot of changes. If Harvard put it out, and BU is very much into it, there's a lot of places into Huntington's disease, and if they're all open, other scientists would be reading it, thinking in different ways, and thinking in a different way. Uh, that that could, will end up with it propelling uh, changes forward. That's what open does. And how open depends, I mentioned. Now, open OER, that's what I was asked to kind of focus on. OER are generally teaching and learning materials. They're textbooks, they're uh, modules, they're PowerPoint slides, they, they can be anything you can imagine that would enhance the learning of the students in your class, okay? Now, as I said up here, in higher ed, the, the lines blur between open access and OER because research is incredibly important for students to be involved with as well as a textbook, or maybe not even a textbook, as I was saying before. So the, it, in the K through 12 world, Textbooks are, are the, the be all and end all, okay? Um, except for a few courses. But here at Open, uh, at, at University of Connecticut, we want to expose students something, you want to pick the right kind of resource for the kind of learning that you want to have done. So, uh, it, uh, what I'm saying is that Open Access and OER are both teaching and learning materials. Uh, although they still, as you can see, they have some differences. So, but the big thing that's different about, about uh, OER is that these are the five R's that are um, endowed to the user. When an item is CC BY, okay, Creative Commons, attribution only, especially if any of you uh, are going to use it, you want to keep using, um, continue to use the latest version, which is the 4.0. So anything you put online that is CC BY, anyone can retain it. They can make, download, make a copy, save the copy. They can redistribute it. They can give it out to all their students. They don't have to get permission from the publisher. Uh, they've already been granted that permission. They can reuse it in different ways. They can use parts of it. They can use the whole. Uh, they can revise it, and that, that's probably one of the bigger things about textbooks. Textbooks in the sciences, as you can see, are extremely, uh, they rot, they, they, yeah. right, yeah, planned obsolescence, <laughs> it's not planned though. Yeah. Um, and as a matter of fact, the faculty member, Dr. Kumar, who is doing our physical chemistry book, he decided to do a physical chemistry book because his favorite physical chemistry book was written in the 60s and is no longer available. And he tried to buy the copyright. It's not being reprinted anymore. You can't find it anywhere. Um, Pearson now owns the copyright. Pearson would not sell the copyright to that book. So he didn't want any of these other textbooks because this was the textbook that he had been teaching for years and it was an excellent textbook. So what he's done is that's why he's created his own textbook that we're working on right now. Because, and it's such a crime 
that that book is just sitting on Pearson's shelf, not able to be used. Um, except for they did allow it to be translated to Spanish, and one in French. <laughs> but that's it. So, uh, remix. Now, those are not, especially the adapt, modify, and improve. That's what is not allowed. Like if you had an open access journal, you had a research publication, you should, nobody should be messing with that. That's your work, this is, this is what you wrote, and they can use that to build on it and make their own publication. But with OER, we're saying here, take this, use it as you need, and make it better, make it uh, as, as you need for your classes. So a new, a new, um, the CARE framework is something that just came out. CARE stands for contribute, attribute. Attribute a lot. Give everybody all, all, the, um, all the credit they deserve for all the work they've done. Release it and empower people to learn by this. So um, this, this CARE framework is, was written by Lisa Petridis, who if any of you know about OER Commons, it's a huge clearinghouse of open and lots of people have, have uh, hubs in there. Uh, I don't know Doug Levin, but C. Edward Watson is uh, a wonderful professor from Georgia who is now at a, uh, one of the university uh, acronyms, I can't forget, it's a national university um, organization. And he has, he, Taught at, when he taught at Georgia, um, he used the OER. Georgia is a whole statewide an OER initiative. And the interesting research that he did just most recently, he took faculty who had taught the courses with a textbook several years ago, many faculty, and he found the same faculty who are now teaching the course with OER in the future. And he got the data from the students and uh, it's an incredible, uh, resounding success that shows that OER, the use of OER with the same teacher, didn't matter, same teacher, caused higher grades for just about everyone, but especially helped students of color and students that were eligible for Pell Grants. So those are the students we really want to be successful and not to have to drop out of, of, of university. So he's, uh, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful person, wonderful researcher. So um, public scholarship, I may talk about this later. Do you all know about Hypothesis? It is, Hypothesis is a web annotation. You simply make an account and then you can annotate any website you would like. I'll leave you to look at that. But I, what I would really like to talk about is marginal syllabus. Um, Okay, marginal syllabus is um, created by Remy Collier, and they have a whole year of reading where they have gotten, uh, they could be even copyrighted articles, but they um, are, every, anyone who would like to, this is the first article, Electing to Heal, Trauma, Healing, and Politics in the Classroom. And they, People join in the discussions and they make comments with hypothesis and then you kind of get this graphic illustration of the hot points that were in that article all the way through. Which ones were people most uh, commenting on? Which comment got the most responses? So you can make a whole graphical map, kind of a heat map of each article as the, as the uh, time goes on. So they've got an October, and December, what's radical about youth writing. These are all available free online and people can comment on them all along. So, um, so that is, well, I'll stop right there and I thank you very much.
questions, but I'm not going to start with the ones that Bruce asked because this one just came in. Thank you. Um, so this is a question I'm going to frame under the idea of di digital democracy and diversity. And I add some context. I mentioned I just came from a combined meeting of the general education curriculum and Delta Gen Ed. I guess Delta Gen Ed is the big daddy and then the GEOC itself is more plebeian. Uh, I'm new here, so I'm learning all these things. But the, on the discussion table was the matter of uh, considerable reshaping of the Gen Ed curriculum at UConn. Uh, so that was the context, but I think Lisa and I were struck by, again, the gender dynamics in the conversation, or who was talking. And that kind of like framed into this question. So I'm wondering what patterns you notice or stories you have about who accesses, who interacts, uh, who contributes, who attributes, who releases, and who empowers across the different kinds of sites that we're working with, particularly in relationship to what might not be coded as a, a dominant speaker or participant. What things are happening out there in these spaces? Can you ask that one more time? Yeah. So what is changing? Let's just take Cairo for example. What have you noticed as things change in terms of who comes to the table, who accesses the material, who interacts over the material uh, in terms of digital democracy and diversity? Diverse voices, and I'd ask the same even about who accessed your material and site and how they interacted over it. Different kinds of voices that you heard. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, one of the cool things about having stuff on the web is you can track who's coming to it. Uh, so like one of the things that we've known about Kairos for a long time is looking at server logs. Um, that we have readers from we like to say, the Ascension Islands to Zimbabwe. And, and that's been true. I've actually met some readers from Zimbabwe, <laughs> which is kind of wild. Um, so in terms of just who, who is looking at the journal, it's, we get read in 150 countries uh, worldwide. Um, in terms of who is authoring for the journal, um, we are getting, uh, I've, I've noticed we haven't actually done um, a count of gender representation in the journal yet, but that's a project that we're about to embark on. If anybody wants to like help me with that, let me know. Um, we're always looking for volunteers. Um, just because anecdotally, I've noticed over the last couple of issues that we're, it's moved away from the more female predominated uh, authors uh, which we we seem to have used to have had more of um, to more male and white male authors. Um, so I'm trying to be very conscientious of that as an editor and how we can direct that through both the, the author mentoring process and the peer review process. Um, because rhetoric and composition is also a, a U.S.-based discipline, you know, most of our authors, 99.5% of them, are based out of the U.S. and a couple in Canada. Um, but we've been specifically branching out um, to other related disciplines that, like communication design, um, given some of the work that I've been doing in Scandinavia, trying to get people to publish there, uh, from there to publish in the journals. But they have different tenure promotion requirements um, in different countries, which impact where they can publish. So that that's, gets complicated. Um, we've had a couple of people from South Africa publish uh, in the journal, both white and black. Um, but it's still a pretty white field for the most part. Yeah. Is that is that what you were thinking? So um, humanities commons, uh, which is uh, a completely open network, um, it was originally founded by the Modern Language Association and started as MLA commons which was a network for MLA members to be able to communicate openly with one another around scholarly work of varying kinds. Um, but we wanted to expand beyond MLA fields and open it up to anyone in the humanities. Humanities Commons is completely open. Anyone who self-identifies as having whatever to do with the humanities that they're interested in can create an account free of charge, can take advantage of all of the, the 
wow, word. Affordances of the network um, and, and you know, can participate in its processes. Um, as a result, um, Humanities Commons, like Kairos, I imagine, like a lot of US-based internet projects, is still English dominant and it's still North American dominant. Um, but we have material that's been deposited in the repository that's connected to Humanities Commons in a couple of dozen languages. Um, we have visits from 168 countries around the world, um, and we're building a much broader audience, which ha and 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 authorship as well, um, which I think has been um, really useful for. Uh, developing a much broader sense of who this network of humanity scholars is and who it ought to be. Um, so that, that has been an extremely positive thing. My experience of, um, of this kind of open scholarship that I've been working in since I started blogging back in 2002, um, I mean, how to say? Um, the, the folks that I have worked with online have looked by and large a whole lot like the profession looks, um, which is to say um, mostly white um, and, you know, skewing, you know, it's, it's the humanities, so skewing slightly female but only slightly, right? Um, that having been said, um, since those early days, the folks who I found myself working with in the most open ways were people who felt not quite included for whatever reason in the academy's mainstream processes. And so they tended to skew early career um, rather than folks who were more established. This is not to say younger necessarily because you know it wasn't a function of age, it was really a function of having established a voice and a platform. And folks who were really looking for that platform found it. Um, and we've seen this develop in digital media studies and in digital humanities both, that these platforms provide spaces for new kinds of communities that are able to come together around particular kinds of work. And so much of the most exciting work that's taking place in digital humanities and digital media studies right now is around um, the work that's being done by um, non-US scholars, by people of color, um, by folks who are working on issues of social justice that hadn't felt that the conventional publishing platforms that they were working with were providing space for the work that they were doing. And so they've come together and they've created new collectives. And that's one of the things that I think is most powerful about these platforms, is that ability to create new, new collectives to do new kinds of work on the fly. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try something now. Uh, kind of like Cheryl, because I don't do things always like the structures necessarily call for. Because what I find in discussions like this is often you have a question, or you, you don't quite yet have a question, but you will. And actually your question might be like someone else's, but we do this thing where we go in and out and in out. So I'd like you to turn to a couple of people right next to you, and just for two minutes here, share what questions you might have for them together, okay? So have a conversation for two minutes, about questions you could come up with together, collaboratively. Thank you. 
the same types of people we would maybe expect to run into at conferences and things. Um, so I was wondering, you know, to what extent does that, um, to what extent then um, can we consider it public, even though technically anybody could access it? Um, how do we actually incorporate people who may feel like they don't have access to some of the terms and conversations we're engaging in? And then consequently, how does that affect uh, what we do in the classroom with our students and how do we bring them into these conversations even if they maybe don't have any intention of becoming academics or going to grad school um, and and even if our students we could consider quote unquote the public considering they're at a university that they are you know to some extent paying to be at um, so and that there's some issues in terms of access and class and uh, et cetera, et cetera, there. Um, so. <laughs> Thank you all, and sorry that I was late. Uh, as we were comparing notes, our question also had to do with interacting with uh, process work and open source scholarship that's shared in formative stages and inviting others into commentary, dialogue, debate, and how to think about that ideal versus the reality, at least, of labor, whether it's in the academy or outside of the academy, where we increasingly have very little time, and I know as I contemplate my own collaboration, putting out a similar formative volume for commentary in past experiences, it often comes down to pleading and nagging friends and family to seed some comments, and that often uh, folks are willing and game, but so overloaded in the contemporary labor environment. So how do we kind of match labor realities to the ideals of practice? Okay, so um, we also spoke about labor realities or um, market realities and um, about validity and uh, whether or not um, online works that are published, uh, open source, open access, are regarded in your field as valid publications and thus help you on the job market or not. And um, we didn't quite formulate a question yet, but so those were the major topics that we did talk about. And I think there are a bunch of questions that one could ask in this direction. So we jumped right from distribution, um, access, dissemination, uh, to, to production. Um, from from Tom's um, sort of Tom's thought on, on a project that he wants to do. Um, he, was, he was talking about uh, high, high school running centers um, and then building like a Kairos like article um, that would definitely have a, a wider access than um, traditional scholarly articles. But um, simply the process of beginning seems to be so much. Um, how do you resist institutional inertia? How do you um, build a project that would look very different from what you've done before, or um, bigger than what you've done before? I'll, I'll let Tom speak to that. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll come back to time that, that, that others have raised as well. Okay, thank you. Hello. Oh. <coughs> Sorry, I'm like, tenure, legitimacy, what? <laughs> <laughs> You know that's always where I want to start. <laughs> okay. Um, my short, facetious answer for that is that you have to learn not to give a crap and just do it. Um, and here I'm specifically, I know, I know, but that's, innovation never comes easy. And we're talking about working within academic cycles and institutions and patterns and you know, dogma that we have learned over hundreds of years 
So if you want to break out of that, then you have to take chances. You have to have risk involved. Um, and ideally, you know, there are there would be a pocket of allowable risk within the work that you're doing. But this question crops up whether you're a master's student or a PhD student or a tenure track scholar, if you're so lucky, right? And if you're a non-tenure track scholar, then God forbid, you know, you should have it take any risks. But maybe you still want to and that there's possibilities there. Or maybe you're in an all DAC position, right? Like working in the libraries where the level of risk seems like it might be more open, but sometimes even they don't feel like that's a possibility. And by they, I mean we, since I'm in that kind of position now. To associate professors to full, there's always going to be some level of institutional pressure to stay within the box because that's what people know, right? But I've made an entire career on breaking out of that box. And I am not a one-off. I'm not, right? Anybody can do this work if they do it earnestly and do it well. I mean, that's not too bootstrappy, is it? I, I don't think so. Okay. Um, I will only add to that, and this is where like institutional me steps forward, that there are um, means through which one can mitigate the risk um, to make sure that the value of the chances that you're taking is visible. Um, Lots of the major scholarly organizations, the Modern Language Association, American Historical, Four Cs, um, several others that I'm not in a college art, um, have statements on the evaluation of digital scholarship for tenure and promotion that lay out guidelines both for review committees to consider that this stuff is actual scholarship and it needs to be reviewed on its own merits and guidelines for candidates to consider. And it is an unfortunate fact of this kind of work that you often have to do a bit more work around the edges of it in order to explain and persuade the folks around you of why you're working in the way that you're working. But one of the key recommendations of those, those policies, and, and the one that I'm most familiar with, obviously, is the Modern Language Association one, is that the candidate begin early on um, by making sure that mentors and senior folks in the department and administrators know what you're doing, know why you're doing it that way, and that they sign on to the value of that work. Um, there are lots of places where you get pushback on that, where you get told, well, that's all well and good after tenure, but first publish the book. Um, we resist that. I resist that very strongly. Um, and I, I think that the scholars need to be able to argue um, for the work that they're doing and for doing it the ways that they want to be able to do it because that's where the impact lies. But it's also possible to ensure um, that there are people out there who have your back as you're doing that work. And I think that phase of it, being willing to argue and advocate for yourself and your ways of working is crucial. Yeah. You won't always have those people having your back at every institution that you're at. So sometimes you have to move around, and sometimes you have to find collaborations, and sometimes you have to go it on your own, but then that's more risk, right? So like, I'm now on my fourth institution since I graduated my PhD. That's by choice. That's because I, I outgrew that box and needed to move on. It's not because I burned bridges. <laughs> Well, all I would have to add is that um, at the University of Connecticut, we have an open, affordable initiative. We have money, right? So if you have a, a project in mind, we have proposal forms for doing things, um, and we can help you with the funding, as well as you could say, well, this is a UConn initiative. So you can bring your, put your institution behind you if it has to be, if it happens to be open. Uh, I gave you an idea of some of the things that we've supported, and I'd love to support many different kinds of things as well. Yeah. No, I, no, we have I, the question up there. Oh, you guys, you could work them together. I think the labor question came up. Oh. 
uh, they, would you like me to talk about why, how OER aren't free? Okay. <laughs> OER, uh, for instance, the, uh, a textbook, that is, there are cheaper ways to do it and there are not, and there are more professional ways to do it. Um, first of all, you have the time that the writer is putting in. That time is not free. You have the librarian who's working with the writer. I'm being paid by the university, and I'm spending almost all of my time on OER now. Um, these are uh, all back ends. Uh, as uh, with our textbooks, we're working with Scribe, which is a, an academic publisher. Uh, you know, they've been in business for a long time, and they happen to feel that publishing is broken now. So they are looking for new ways uh, to get books out there to people. So that's why they've partnered with some, uh, an organization called the Open Textbook Network, which we are a member of. And so that's why I got the training, long training. So there's, there, there's always, there is a lot of uh, behind the scenes expenses. The students don't have to pay for it unless they want a print copy. Then there's a cost because they'll have to, pay that, but um, those are generally what the, what the hidden costs of production are. Plus, the, I guess the other part is the repository. We're going to have all these materials housed in a repository. I don't think that's a huge uh, burden at all on most large universities, but we have to have that infrastructure and we have to keep it there. How's that? Yeah. Okay, so I want to add on, add on to that. The other side of the OER are free point is, um, is digital publishing is not uh, quick. <laughs> just, just so that you know, like when we're, when we're talking about these digital publishing projects, whether it's OER or starting a whole new press, there, there are, it's not free, right? There's additionally servers. Um, there are the human, the human resources, uh, the, the um, hardware resources. Um, and then there's the learning that has to, to take place, right? Like, I joke about Kairos having a no money in, no money out business model. <laughs> That's relatively true, except for all of the time, right, that people put in, the training that people put into it. Um, but it's also not quick. It takes, on average, about 18 months for uh, a web text to get from um, peer review to publication. 18 months, right? And we publish twice a year, but that's because our copy editing cycle lasts five months on average. It's incredibly rigorous, has an eight stage process that it goes through. So to, to step into that question at the end about like the legitimacy of online journals and where to publish, that's a completely disciplinarily specific question, right? It depends on what, what academic discipline you're in. Um, so you just have to kind of know and look around, but you want to look for the peer review process and how visible it is and, you know, Sometimes your advisors will know, sometimes they won't. It just depends on, on how in touch they are with that stuff. But I'm gonna pop back all over to this repository issue and just rant for a second about that. Or would you like to rant no, about that? No, please uh, okay. rant away. <laughs> you, can, you can jump in here with me, Kathy. We can sing a duet <laughs> um, about. So I don't know if y'all are familiar with how institutional repositories work. Are you familiar with that phrase at least? institutional repository. It's shorthanded as IR in, in library land, as, as I like to call it. Um, and there's a couple of big companies that run IRs that provide the software as a service to universities that they pay for. It's just how like Blackboard or, or Canvas or like one of those things where you pay somebody a bajillion dollars and they give you a platform. That's crap, but you have to use it. And so there's this one big company out there uh, called B Press that runs an institutional repository that like a third of the libraries in the world use B-Press as their IR. Um, do y'all use it here? Okay, so. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> I needed that permission. Uh, so last summer, was it just last summer? Yeah. Elsevier, which is one of the top, thank you for that reaction. <laughs> That is the appropriate reaction. <laughs> Elsevier purchased B Press. Okay? B Press, the thing about institutional repositories is they're always open access, right? They're always pushing the scholarship out there to be open so that people can access it without, and it might be a preprint or it might be the final version, etc. I'm totally tramping on Kathy's territory here, but like I'm very passionate about 
being anti Elsevier um, because they've given money to arms dealers in the past. Like there's all sorts of shady, crappy business practices that they've done. And now they've bought one of the primary IRs in the world and they're going to do something awful with it because that's what Elsevier does. So there's a whole movement in academia now to create, so free, like there's no free, R, free OERs, like yeah, now we're giving money to Elsevier to publish our free textbooks. So this is a bit of a problem um, in library land and we're trying to do things to ameliorate that. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons why institutional repositories grew up in libraries in particular was because libraries were attempting to overcome the incredibly awful monopolistic business practices of commercial publishers like Elsevier. So instead of paying thousands upon thousands of dollars for the subscriptions um, and making sure that no one who didn't have a subscription could see the material that was being produced at the university, um, libraries created repositories so that the open access version, whether a preprint or a postprint or what have you, could be deposited and made available to the world. Right. So the IR's whole goal is to undermine the monopolistic business practices of Elsevier, and now Elsevier has bought the repository. This is a massive problem. Um, but I, I want to connect a couple of these questions and, and sort of see if I can loop some things back together. And we started with the... Yeah. Yeah, it was, there was something in between. What was your question? The access. It's that one that's up there. The uh, continuing conversation about access. Yeah, actually, it was not the access question. It was the one right before. It was yours. Uh, we were talking about uh, balancing like wanting to be accessible with like the traditional. Like, Paving the road in front of you. Yes, of course. That was it. Right? Like, and yeah, the the the, the risk taking and and the dual purposes of, of right. Okay. Now trying to remember my path through there to labor. And it was the, the why OERs aren't free, because there are hidden labor costs, connecting to this question of labor in getting a community to contribute to a project when that community has a whole lot of other stuff to do. Um, this is, this is a, a, a real issue. Um, and it's something that, that we've seen um, both with open review projects that I've been involved in and with other kinds of open scholarly project. Um, I mean, and we're having this conversation on my campus right now about the nature of collaboration and what collaborative projects means. Um, collaboration is, is like one of those things that we say we all want to you know, we want to collaborate. We all want to like work on these collaborative projects. But what collaboration seems to mean a whole lot of times is that I want to be the PI and I want everybody else to work on my project, um, rather than I actually want to contribute to someone else's project, right? And it's similar with the open review process. Like, if I'm the author and you're contributing to my project by commenting on my work, that's great. But I don't know if I have time to comment on everybody else's work. And it's evidence of where the reward structures of the university lie, right? They lie in being the author. They lie in being PI. They lie in being the one who gets to put the line on the CV, right? And not the one who is contributing to and supporting and collaborating um, on that work. So what we really have to attack is those reward structures within the university and really think about how it is that we are creating a culture of participation in which people are not just encouraged to collaborate, bring other people into their projects, but are in fact rewarded for their contributions to other people's projects. Right? In which you are seen publicly as being a good peer reviewer, and that is just as important as being a smart author. And that is a big part of why I think open peer review ultimately, I mean, it's got a long road to go in order to get established and to get people to participate, but I think it stands a chance because that work is visible, because the hidden labor of peer review suddenly becomes something for which you can be known. 
And so instead of having that one footnote at the beginning of the article that thanks reviewer one for that great idea you gave me, instead you can trace that conversation and see how the idea came from a collaboration between the reviewer and the author rather than it seeming like something that the author came up with all on their own, right? So that I think is, I mean, it's again, university reward structures and a kind of rewiring of the academic brain to recognize that those individualistic goals of being PI or being author um, or first author are not really where we ought to be concentrating our attention, but instead on those community building practices that will enable all of us to do more better work. Yeah. For, I mean, anecdotally, that's why I left the tenure track because I didn't, yeah, I was, I thought I was happy being PI on all this and that and the other and publishing this and that and the other and authoring. But in the end, what I really wanted, what I really wanted to be doing was taking all the knowledge that the field of digital writing studies had collect, collated and, and created around digital publishing and multimodal publishing and being able to bring that to other disciplines and be able to create mechanisms for everybody to be able to do that kind of work and for the collaboration to actually count for something. And just as an irony, you know, I, I step into the library as a as an interloper in some ways, you know, not having a library science degree, but sort of working adjacently, I know, right? Yeah, some people do clutch their pearls when I tell them that. Um, and the librarians say to me, oh, we don't, we're terrible at collaborating. And I just mm -hmm. laugh my head off and I said, y'all need to go work in an academic department and see how bad faculty members are at collaborating. They don't have to do it, right? But like librarians also, FYI, also do not like to be taken advantage of. And they will let you sometimes, but they're not there to serve you on your project. They're there to think through your project with you. So that's just my little PSA for uh, acknowledging and valuing the research of your librarians. <coughs> I second what she said. Thank you all for coming. So thanks to Aga for organizing the whole event yes. and to Kathleen and Carol. And Kathy, for paving the road for us, even as they are still walking it. And Ruth, thank you for putting questions up. <laughs> Rob, thank you for his behind the scenes care of contributing, attributing, releasing, and empowering work. Thank you all for coming. Okay.